The $1.2 million research project that we're going to talk about today is about developing advanced analytical protocol. We have three areas that we're going to talk about. And standing over here is, is Ann Smith. She does some stray gas, stray methane gas. That's the, I don't know if you saw the gas lamp video, the flaming faucet in the gas lamp video. That didn't come from hydraulic fracturing. That came from a coal seam. We found that out through scientific research by carbon dating the methane. And now we're trying to further understand how methane underground and in water moves around. Anne has had some wonderful discoveries. I'm going to give her a few slides so that she can have a discussion about that. And then I'm going to go into the air piece. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about the Texas A&M University system. Our institute is this one down here, OK? And if you notice, we're not over there underneath the universities themselves. We are underneath the system. And the system is split up into the universities and a health science center, and then the agencies. Because Texas A&M is a land, sea, and space grant university system, we are actually a state agency. And within that agency, you've got things like the vets, you've got the forest service, you've got TTI, which is the Texas Transportation Institute, and then you've got TEAS, which is where all the engineers hang out. That's the Texas Engineering Experiment Station. And then you have TEKS. They do all the training and the education. And, and then underneath there, you have Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and Research. Extension is our boots on the ground. They take the, the, the pointy-headed, nerdy researchers like myself, and the extension agents will actually go out into the communities and talk to the regular folks about the research that we do. And then, of course, Texas AgriLife Research uh, where is, is actually where I do most of my work. We had a lot of discussions about collaborative. Uh, I'm really excited to see that PTAC is forming collaboratives. We have one in the United States, too. It's called the Environmentally Friendly Drilling Systems Program. Uh, Texas A&M is actually uh, a manager on that group. But as you can see, we have environmental organizations from Environmental Defense Fund and Nature Conservancy. This is actually an outdated slide. There's a lot more on there now. Uh, we have sponsors because we can't do this stuff for free. So over here, we see we've got a lot of oil and gas industry, but we also have some governmental groups as well. We have collaborators like uh, Alamo Area Council of Governments and the Groundwater Protection Council. And then we have alliance members that, uh, that can give us advice as we, as we move out. Again, not enough room on the slide to talk about what we do. We have over 30 different universities doing research. And, and as, as they said in my bio, I oversee everything west of the Mississippi River. So that's west of, uh, west of the United States within this organization. These are just a few of the uh, research topics. Uh, during the, the panel discussion and in some of the comments, uh, I noticed one of the residents said, I don't have the money to pay for a baseline water sampling program. And that's happening in Texas too, by the way. And so we've developed low-cost water screening kits. Screens for anywhere from 18 to 20 different chemicals from oil and gas companies. You can test your own water well. That's actually Dr. Dave Burnett with the engineering department out at A&M. He's also a petroleum engineer. And this is a, a very low-cost $20 is what it will cost. And it gives you a detect. It doesn't give you a measurement. But it'll tell you if you've got a, I'd like a red, yellow, green. And if you've got a red, then you might want to consider one of those more expensive tests, right? We have air measurement. We have produced water treatment. That's a mobile lab. Because if you go out and try to figure out what's in flowback water, if you take your sample, you take it off to the lab, and you wait six weeks, guess what? It's going to be different water when you get back there to treat it. And so your filters that you've set up are not going to work. You need on-site, real-time analytics, and that's also part of this research project. Soil impacts and, uh, and livestock impacts, that's actually me, and we're putting, uh, I think we might be doing soil sampling, but we also are we're doing, oh, that's me down there, there's manure sampling. Yes, we take cow poo and we put it in bags and we send it off to the lab to see if they're ingesting any hydrocarbon product. Um, we do temporary roads. Okay, so, so we're not laying concrete and asphalt all over the landowner's property. We'll lay down a road, and it's got to be able to support the weight of these rigs. And we've tested about 20 or so different, different designs, and we found some really, really good ones. And, uh, and that's what we use to minimize impact. We have issues with invasive species that you can see here that we're working with. Um, 
Tree tobacco in Texas is poisonous to cattle. And if it comes in on the treads of the oil and gas equipment, then we got a problem between the Texas ranchers and the Texas oil and gas folks. And that's a fight that you kind of want to see, right? All right, so, no. Get your popcorn, right? Because they're a lively bunch. Education and outreach, we've done an, an EFD uh, virtual rig. So if you feel like you're, you want to know more about rigs, you can go to the efdsystems.org website and you can tour a drilling rig. We're building one right now to tour a hydraulic frack job. Characterization, that is basically analytics. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then advanced analytics, which is the area that I'm in. And then here's our DOE project overview. DOE, Department of Energy. That's a, it's like, it's like the energy side of the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. Okay, they give us a lot of our, a lot of our grant money. And there's, as you see, there's three components to this research project. There's that stray gas, that methane in the water that I talked about just a minute ago. There's the air emissions. And then the produced water treatment, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second too. Again, overall, I got 1.2 million, but it's 3.5 million for everybody. There's three of us on this. And it's split up into phase one and phase two. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And its objective is to conduct quantitative evaluation of current methods and develop regulations for characterizing blah, 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 blah. What that means is we have to have a methodology, we have to have a protocol before we go out. Because everybody is doing their science differently. And like I said in the panel, if you can't repeat it, you can't defend it. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm uh, leading the effort on the stray methane gas baseline sampling portion of the DOE project that Susan just talked about. And there have been discussions this morning and there are a lot of concerns that are associated with stray gas impacts to drinking water wells from hydraulic fracturing operations. And most notably, there's been a lot of concern raised about that in Marcellus Shale. And so the biggest question is, how do you determine whether an impact has occurred? Uh, for instance, if you look at data from our cell shale and you look at water welfare, you see that there are natural sources of methane within the groundwater there. So how do you determine whether the variations that you see in methane are induced variations or natural <coughs> variations? And how do you perform sampling such that you get appropriate data to, to be able to assess those impacts? So that's the biggest challenge, is how do you differentiate between an, an induced impact and a natural change in variability in methane concentrations. So what we're doing under this project is we're looking at how you characterize pre-drill groundwater quality to evaluate possible post-drill impacts, in other words, changes in methane concentrations. And so we started this project by asking four critical questions. What's normal water quality and variability? You got to know that first, right? Uh, what parameters should we be analyzing for? There are lots of guidance documents out there that recommend lots of different parameters to analyze for at lots of different different distances at lots of different intervals. Uh, how do we evaluate test results so that we can distinguish between those types of impacts? And lastly, how does sampling influence or the sampling process itself? How does that influence our results? So what we did was we've taken 2,500 data sampling points, pre-drilled data from water wells in the Marcellus Shale area, and we started looking at what are some key prediction factors that we can use to determine the natural state of the groundwater before any drilling or any other activities have occurred. And what we found is that there are three really strong prediction factors that when, you, when they are combined, when you see them all together and you, and you assess your water quality with these prediction factors, they very well predict the levels of methane concentrations you're going to see under natural conditions. And those factors are water type. So what we found in the Marcellus Shale was the highest methane, elevate, uh, methane concentrations were observed in sodium-rich waters in the Marcellus Shale. Uh, topography, the valleys have higher methane concentrations than the uplands, which really actually kind of seems like a no-brainer. And lastly, we looked at redox state. 
and that is uh, the biological processes that are going on, the chemical processes. When you have advanced redox conditions and you have sulfate that's been depleted and iron depleted, you're going to get high methane levels. Now, this is important for characterizing the characteristics of, of water within the Marcellus shale. That doesn't mean that this is going to hold for every other shale play, but it's important that you have a pre-drill idea of what your water looks like so you can determine whether you have a change in those conditions. Uh, the second part of the project that I'm, as I mentioned, was how do you appropriately sample? And we just finished a large field program. We're in the process of evaluating the data where we're looking at uh, how you do, how you take into consideration sampling variability. For instance, do you purge? How long do you purge? And what kind of variation do you get in your results if you don't purge water at all versus doing a large purge and purge just means pulling a bunch of water out and, and then collecting your sample. So at what time during the purge do you collect the sample to have an accurate sample? Um, we look at collection methods, inverted bottle versus just pouring it in and free filling it. And then also we look at the containers that are used. Isotech has just come out with an isoflask, uh, typically what's historically used are these boa vials. And so how does the different sampling methodology you employ change your methane concentration. Because the reality is, if you have a methane impact, you want to know it. If you don't have a methane impact, go on with your lives. So, um, and then the last thing was temporal variability. What kind of changes do you see naturally over time for ge water geochemistry, the isotopes um, for methane, and um, the water quality? And so, we're, as I said, we are just starting to get some of those results. And what we're hoping is that these types of studies and these types of, of results can better help you analyze your naturally occurring ranges of methane concentrations so that you can determine whether you really have an impact or not. Again, this is a picture of a water trailer. That was the first part of the project. Um, the second part of the project is, is on the water side. Again, um, when you're going out and you're putting these on-site mobile analytical labs and you're trying to test the water in real time, in order to properly recycle flow back water, you have to know what's in that water. And they're building the protocols for that as we speak. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through this research project. I'm gonna do it quick. I'm gonna do it in 10 minutes. The first thing you have to assess, remember we're building a protocol here, so I'm gonna go through the steps for you. First thing you do is you have to identify your scientific challenges. What types of instrumentation are out there for the measurement of gaseous air pollutants? Of concern right now, the hot one is methane, right? Everybody's interested in methane, it's a greenhouse gas, but there's many others. There's hazardous air pollutants and, and there's ozone forming pollutants and those kinds of stuff as well. Uh, we have things called gas analyzers, they take a single point but they give you a whole lot of information about one chemical, but it's, it's only one point, and they can be very expensive. Photoionization detectors, we call them PIDs for short. Those, are, those measure non-methane hydrocarbons. Not of much interest to folks. They're relatively inexpensive, but, uh, but because it's a non-methane hydrocarbon, you, uh, you really don't get a good emissions reading from it, and they can be somewhat inaccurate. Canisters, have something called suma canister. It's like this, this little barrel, and you open it up, and it sucks air in, and, and you can send it off to the lab, and you can get a very good uh, reading from that, but it's a snapshot in time, so not necessarily what we want either. There are systems called open path Fermier transform infrared systems, and there's a picture of one right here. Uh, shoots an infrared beam, and, and they can measure, and they can not only detect, but they can measure half the integrated concentration. Shoots an infrared beam out to a retroreflector, which is basically a mirror, and sends it back, and it will pick up everything within that beam that absorbs the infrared spectrum. And by the way, a lot of different molecules absorb the infrared spectrum, and they absorb the infrared spectrum differently. We've had in the United States over 15 to 20 years of research on spectral absorption of air pollutants, and we have a spectral library that we use. So what? So I know what chemicals pass over my beam. How do I know where they come from? Well, we're integrating weather stations to get that information. This system was created by the, by the Department of Defense, and it was originally designed to detect 
chemical warfare, and it has since been uh, tweaked to uh, scientific use. It is one of the only systems that's went through the EPA's Environmental Verification Technology Program, and we have labs that, that do very intense QAQC, it's called NELAC, and it's the only system that's been NELAC certified. So we chose that one to write a protocol on, because that's the best system we think that can be in the field. Then we wrote out our scope. We're basically going to write a protocol for short-term monitoring. That's you're going to go set up, set up for a week or a month or something, and you're going to then you're going to tear down. We rig up, you rig down things like drilling, fracturing, and then we can do long-term modeling, uh, production, compression. Um, hey, Victor, you in the room? See Desica and Juliet that uh, came out to our to our site. We're we're actually playing with the Open Path FTI here on one of our what we call pre-trials. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Before I go into open path FTIRs and the protocol the development for it, let me give you a little bit of theory. They're basically like a particle counter. It'll sum up the total energy that a given chemical will absorb at a particular wavelength. Okay? And then that energy measurement is compared against the known spectra, which is the infrared spectrum. These are the peaks in the infrared spectrum that these chemicals make. And then it's averaged over a path, a beam path, basically. Weather data is integrated, and that will give us direction back to the source. This is some of the equipment. I won't spend much time on this, but I, it, it's, it's in your book. So those of you, I know Alberta Regulator has purchased a couple of these, so I put these on here. These are, this is the primary equipment you're going to need. You've got your, that's called a spectrometer. That's the brain, and then you've got, that's the laser there. The retro reflector, that's NASA technology, and yes, that is gold. If we use the flat mirror, you have to get that beam like exactly right. And we can put this thing miles away. And we don't want to have to get it exactly aligned, right? So it's, it's faceted. It kind of looks like, like, like little orbs there, but it's actually just multifaceted. That way we can just get it in a general area, and it'll reflect back. We have a, a typical weather station. Most of you that's worked in air have seen these kinds of weather stations. Then we have what's called a 3D ultrasonic anemometer. I don't know where they come up with these names, but it sounds smart when you say it. Anemometer, 3D ultrasonic anemometer. Okay. Basically what, what an anemometer does, a regular weather station will give you north, south, east, west, wind direction and speed, right? This will give you the tilt of the wind. So I know the wind speed and direction of the tilt. If the wind's coming in this way, I can use the power of mathematics to determine where it came from. It could have came from 20 miles away. All right? There's our primary equipment. We did a controlled methane release. Okay, so controlled methane release. This is just methane canisters. This is a, a mass flow controller. We have to know how much methane we're releasing. And then this is a bucket. Yeah, it's from Lowe's. And we, we Frankenstein this thing and, and you know, put a, put a bulkhead in there and punch some holes in it and that simulates a methane coming up out of, a, out of the source. You don't want to turn on the canisters and launch that stuff into space, right? So it just kind of wafts out. Uh, we have to run our equipment remotely. Never get a regular generator. Okay, this is sensitive equipment. You will shoot it to the moon. All right? Has to be an inverter generator. Your power has to first go to a microprocessor. Campers have microprocessors in them. Laptops and sensitive weather equipment that costs a lot of money do not always get an inverter generator. Generac has one for about 500 bucks. Okay, secondary equipment uh, stuff, you know, laptops, extension cord, grounding supplies, compass, a ladder if you're not very tall because you can't get up on top of your weather station to tell where true north is, things like that, right? And then all that other stuff that makes life easier, right? Things you don't want to forget when you go to the field, particularly in South Texas, first aid, bug spray, extra water, snacks, music, right, whatever. Okay, then we do our initial site design. This is the engineering, the conceptual design of how all the equipment goes together. Again, you have this in your, in your book and you can look at it in detail. You've got your canisters going through two-stage regulator, mass flow controller, you've got Teflon tubing going down to here, you've got your beam shooting across it, this is a power controller for your FTIR, your generator, your two weather stations, and two laptops. You need a laptop for the anemometer and you need a laptop for the uh, for the integrated weather station and the FTIR. And yes, the FTIR and its integrated weather station are collecting weather data and concentration data at the exact same second. 
For those of you that have had to do concentration and weather post-processing, I'm sure you're smiling because that's a real bummer. Okay, then we did our field planning. This is basically what, it's, what it looks like in the field. We were out at campus in a very, very remote part of the campus. We released our methane. We had EPA there, okay? This is a very small amount of methane compared to what's, what's in the air, so EPA wasn't too concerned about our 41 liters per minute that we released out here on the site. And we shot a beam across it, and when we set up the FTIR at different configurations. We need to know what right looks like before we go out to an oil and gas site, correct? Okay. Then we kind of tested it downwind from a construction site. That's actually our office right there. We went over to this park and we hope nobody kicked us out and we set stuff up. We thought maybe we should put on, you know, moon suits and tell people it's a shrink ray or we're paranormal investigators or something. But uh, we, we did. We had a lot of interested people stop by. And uh, we made friends, right? This is an actual picture of the site. This is a Google Maps, it's a little bit outdated, so there was a lot of activity going on. Then we set up our chemicals. The uh, RAM 2000 Open Path FTIR that we used, it's, it's created by CASA, and they, um, they actually have a, a software system in it that you can set up your, your uh, chosen gases. It'll measure all 300 of them. But you don't want a screen with all 300 of them up there, right? So you can pick some and it'll actually show them in real time. These are the uh, 11 that we chose. Water must always be chosen as an interferent. They have, you have to average out water vapor or it will skew your results. That's what it looks like. That's all that is. The C is concentration. These are the different spectral peaks up at the top right here. And these are these are the where they where they hit. All right, this is that spectral library I was telling you about. Water, that I stands for interference. You see, water's in there, and so when it finds water, it averages it out. That helps. And then you have to establish a background. This is just uh, there's some writing there about about why we establish a background. But for most people that do air emission measurement, that's pretty obvious. And then kind of hard to see on this one, but it's light yellow. You can actually see the absorbance spectra. This is the controlled methane release. And this is the actual corresponding concentration at study site one. We have we had a whole bunch of different frames. I just showed one here for reference. And this is with the weather data rolled in. This is like wind rows, only it's pollution rows, right? So we know the the uh, uh, methane was, de was definitely coming from this direction. And it, it proved that it, it works generally. We would like to get it narrowed down a little bit more. And then this was for the site that was downwind from the construction activity. As you notice, we've got lots of different kinds. These are all VOCs. These come from tailpipes of bulldozers and things like that. If you notice they're green, that means that it's not of any real concern. This is, this is the frame that had the most stuff on it. All right, we had toluene, two different types of xylene, and carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide was actually the highest, and so we did a directional analysis on the, on the carbon monoxide in real time out there, and we saw that it was mainly coming from the construction side, with a little bit coming from this way, a little bit coming from that way. That's because we had construction vehicles circling us all the time in that park, because I don't know if there's anybody from AT&T here, so I'm going I'm to pick on them, because they have a big old lot over here, and they never let anybody park in it. So all the guys in the construction vehicles had parked out on the, on the alley roads. And I, we think that's just where the rest of it came from. So that's where we're at. Where our next steps of phase one, we're going to take the anemometer data. Remember, we were taking just two-dimensional weather data. Those were just two-dimensional pollution rows. Anemometers, three dimensions. So we could have, for each particle, we could have coordinates, x, y, and z coordinates. We could tell its height, we can get emission rates, and we can take that and we can load it into a model. Backward time Lagrangian stochastic modeling. Fancy word, another, another name thing. Where do they come up with? Okay, Lagrange, Lagrangian. Lagrange is just a famous mathematician that came up with the model. Stochastic is a method. It's a mathematical method, okay? Well, we have big chemical fires or something like that and our emergency folks roll out with big vans and they put the sensors into the air and they have this model that they tell where the plume's going based on the wind speed and direction. That's a stochastic model, okay? 
you're predicting where it's going, that's forward. We want to know where it came from, so we reverse the mathematics and we take a mathematical funnel back to the source. Backward time Lagrange is the classic modeling. There is actually a uh, free uh, where uh, they're called wind tracks. So if you ever feel like playing with a backward time Lagrange is the classic model, you can download wind tracks and play with one yourself. Okay, we're going to test this hypothesis. If 3D weather data is combined with concentration data and modeled with BLS, then the emission source accuracy will improve. Then I'll move us into phase two, which will start probably in the fall. Uh, we've been talking with Stat Oil. Oh, sorry, this is Pioneer. We've been talking with Pioneer on field testing short-term measurement. This is for drilling rigs. They have a drilling rig that's powered by diesel and dual fuel, and they want to know the emission differences in both of them. We're going to give them the data, and we're going to give the Department of Energy the protocol. Stat Oil. Down here at a production facility, this actually isn't from Stat Oil, this is from a Pioneer tour, but you get the idea it's a production facility. Uh, they want to look at more long-term monitoring that they could maybe go into a real-time nerve center that will tell them, oh, I have an emissions problem, maybe I have a leak, I need to go out and I need to find out what's going on with it. This is Pioneer's more detail. This is a four-component measurement study. We're going to develop a protocol. Uh, for again for the DOE. The study site is going to be in the Eagle Ford. It's going to be a rig powered, like I said, by diesel and natural gas. Again, data goes to Pioneer, protocol goes to the Department of Energy. And when we work with oil and gas companies, sometimes we don't we don't release that data. Alright? That doesn't mean we're being sneaky. It means the oil and gas industry doesn't want to be thrown under the bus, but they want to fix it. Okay, so we'll agree to that. We'll go out there, we'll work with them, and we will help them fix it. And that's, that's some of what we're doing here. We're also going to be taking tailpipe measurements out on that rig so that our ambient measurements can also be aligned with tailpipe measurements. Not an easy thing to do on a drilling rig, by the way. And then here's the long-term monitoring protocol. This is attempting to separate background emissions from source. Okay, how do I know it's coming from my production facility and not someone else's facility upwind? If it's coming along the same line, how do I know? Well, that tilt might give us an idea. We don't know yet, we need to test it. That'll happen this fall. And then future research, we've got five or six proposals in. What if, instead of getting that in real time, we got this? If we combine the anemometer data, the BLS model, and a GIS, we could get this on our computers in real time as the system is running. And that's pretty cool. And so we hope we get funded for it. The proposals are going in.